Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, my, my name is Sirka Kremzer. I work for Red Hat on a project called Renalytics.io, and we empower developers to building. We empower developers to build their intelligent applications. So today I'm going to talk about blockchain analysis and also about uh, <coughs> processing of graphs in Spark. And yeah, so this is the outline. First, I will describe briefly blockchain because it's just 30, 30 minutes, so it will be really brief. Then how to represent the blockchain transaction as a graph. Then how to tackle those, this graph from Spark perspective. It will be slightly relevant to the talk from the, from the Neo4j guys from about this open cipher. And substantial part will be the demo. It will be half of the presentation. So hopefully it will work. Because I've tried an hour ago, an hour ago and it didn't work because on, of IPv6. So I hope I will be more lucky. So yeah, there's, the room is crowded. But I guess because this is because the blockchain and, and the hype around it. It's everywhere, right? Unfortunately, the price went, went down, I don't know, two days ago because it's still really re volatile. Honestly, I, I don't care about the price. I don't care about the market. All I care about is the tech, and I'm going to describe how it works. You know, I, I don't, I'm not going to influence you if you should buy or sell. It's not my business. So what it is, it's distributed ledger system. It tries to create distributed consensus, which is a segue to the previous talk, right? But... The, when it comes to data structure, it's just the linked list uh, of blocks. So as you can see, there's, there's one block, and there is a link to the ad, another one, and another one. And each new block has the reference to the previous one. So it's basically linked list, single linked list. The trust stems from the so-called Merkle trees, that's hash-based structures, and something called ma mining. Mining is, it's all, they also call it proof of work. And it's an act of en uh, lending your computing power to ensure that the system or the network behave uh, correctly. Uh, to m make it more clear, people, people try to find a nonce, which is a piece of random data that is then put to the block. And if it is hashed with 256 hash function, and the result targets is uh, lower than some number, some threshold. They call it difficulty. We succeeded and we find a new block and we are rewarded by the network, by some bitcoins and also all the fees that uh, were in the block. This is the detail of one block. So as you can see, or, or not, it's very really small. There's something called magic number which identifies the network because it's not I'm going to talk today about Bitcoin blockchain, but there are different flavors of Bitcoin, of, of blockchain. And this magic number identifies the, the, the type of the blockchain. There are also blockchains for Namecoin. This is very similar to, to Bitcoin. So if, if it is relatively similar, it can be identified with this magic number. If it is different cryptocurrency like Ethereum or I don't know, IOTA, it is completely different architecture for, for the trust. So these are... I would say like more diverged than the, from the blockchain than some more similar. There is also something called the Merkle root. There's the hashed, hash of everything in there. And the nonce, that is, this is the part that was used for, for solving the block. So, and today each, each block has a hard limit of one meg. It's relatively small. So only limited amount of transactions, transactions would fit to, to the block. And miner basically, miners basically uh, favors those transactions that uh, that put more fee into the you know, for, for more for more fee for, for miners because when you create a new transaction, it's up to you how much should be the, how much the fee should be. So if it is like small number, it would take ages to get to to confirm. So in traditional banking system, the, the conventional banks. If I want to send money to someone, my bank basically holds my account, my balance, and it checks if I have enough money for the transaction. I don't know the details, but I think it's stored in some relational database like Oracle or something. And then it will sub subtract my money and send, send it to someone else. In blockchain, it's completely different. If Alice wants to send some money to Bob, she has to basically spend all their money 
and there is implementation details that they, so they can send the rest of the transaction back to her. So for, there is some, something called input, so she will create a transaction with one input and two outputs. And as we can see, there, there is an output that has address back to her, so it is a self-loop. She, she has to spend all their money, but she is allowed to uh, send her money back to her. And so yeah, there is a uh, simple rule that sum of all the inputs has to be equal or higher than, than some of the outputs. It's higher, uh, what is higher that, what's, uh, I mean, if, if we subtract some of the inputs, outputs and some of the inputs, the difference is the fees, if it's the fee of the transaction. So, and as, I've sent, as, as I mentioned, the confirming is finding the nonce for the block. So as you, uh, here in this, in this example, Alice is trying to send uh, 2.0 bitcoins to Bob. So he said that he, has not, he doesn't have any bitcoins. If the transaction is confirmed, now he has balance 0 0.2 bitcoins and Bob is happy. So this is happy Bob. <laughs> this is transactional in more, more general case because before we had just one input and two outputs, but it doesn't have to be this way. In this case, we have three out, three inputs, and as you can as you can see, there are reference the unsped output from previous transactions. So this is basically the graph of the old transactions. Each input has to be connected to the previously unspent output, and by referencing it, we basically spend it. One thing I didn't mention that uh, miners have to also verify that uh, the guy is allowed to do the transaction, because all the addresses are fingerprints of public keys and he has to prove that he owns the money by, by his private key. But now, how to represent it as a graph? Uh, because we, we can have multiple input and multiple output transactions. It's hard to say which address sends money to whom. So my first shot was to create bipartite graph when I connected all the inputs with all the outputs. And I used this representation for one of my notebooks when I'm calculating page rank because that's all I need. I have also different representation I will show in the different next slide, which has more details. So I use Apache Parquet as a, as a format because it's uh, suitable for Spark. Spark can open those Parquet files. It supports um, partitioning, so I can put different, different piece of data on different, different nodes. And it also has schema. And it's, it's columnar, so it's suitable for this NoSQL or distributed processing. Right, and I've also developed an application called Blockchain, uh, sorry, Parquet Converter. It's based on other, based on other open source project. And what it does, it takes uh, the binary, binary files you have on your disk if you have official Bitcoin client. If, if you run official Bitcoin client, it downloads all the universe. It's, I don't know. 280 gigabytes, and you can use this converter to, to run it and create the, the, this parquet, parquet representation. So ideally, I would like have some network and run some analysis on top of it. So this is the other approach I have chosen. I use it also for the other notebook, and here I have more information. I have notes of addresses, notes of transactions, and also notes of blocks. So I have information in, in which block the transaction appeared and also I have uh, amounts of uh, satoshis that were sent on in, in the network. In the previous representation I have only edge that some address was communicating somehow with the other address. Here I have more information, I'm basically capturing these multi-input and multi multiple output transactions. Right, so how to tackle graphs from Spark? There, are, there is pre-built library or module called GraphX and some, some external one called graph frames. You have to put some Java files on, on class path to be able to use it. So I have two notebooks and one uses GraphX and the other one uses graph frames. There is a lot of, or there is a couple of built-in functions in Spark. For instance, for label propagation, page rank, counting triangles. But it's extensible. It, it supports something called Preggle, which is a toolkit that, declarative toolkit where you can describe as something called super step in which you say uh, it's iterative method where you very specify that you accept messages from the from the neighbors you update the state 
and you send them those messages to our neighbors. And in this iteratively approach, you can achieve something pretty, 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 pretty complex algorithms. And there is a language in graph frames, there is a language called Motif and is inspired by Cypher, but it's not as powerful, but, but it's there. So as if you were here on the, the lecture about Cypher, you will probably know more than I. So this is the basic architecture of Spark for those who are not familiar. It's ETL toolkit or framework. It stores everything in in-memory, if not so otherwise. It also supports off-heap off uh, memory. And it had a lot of bindings to other languages like Python or R, so it's suitable for data scientists. It's written in Scala, so there is native support for Scala and Java. And the architecture, so there is always something called driver program that holds the application and it communicates with the master node that coordinates all those workers and schedules the work to those executors. So executor runs on worker node and it runs those tasks. So, yeah, talk is cheap, Let, let's do the demo. Oops. Is the phone visible? Should be, right? So what, what I'm gonna do, um, I have a cluster that contains OpenShift and I'm gonna uh, create a new Spark cluster there. So I'm gonna use something called Oshinko, it's an open source library we develop, and I'm gonna deploy a new cluster. I will make two workers and call the cluster uh, FOSDEM. And here, sorry, oops. Here I have the con OpenShift console and I can see there is nothing there. Yeah, there is nothing there. So if I run the command, it should start deploying the cluster. As I can see, there is one, ma one master deployed for me and two pods of worker. By the way, OpenShift is similar to Kubernetes, but it supports additional features like security templates. But it's very, very similar as, Open, as Kubernetes. Actually, Kubernetes is running uh, under the covers. So now the cluster is up and running, and I can deploy my um, my notebook application, Jupyter Notebook. To do that, I will use new app. It's also this is OC is OpenShift client. So I'm deploying my uh, Docker container, but it also supports these OCI containers by Cryo. But here I have to specify the name of the master, so I called it uh, FOSDEM, right? So if I do that, it will deploy the, the Spark, uh, the Jupyter Notebook. What I have to also do is to, to expose the root, because by default, if I deploy something to OpenSheet, it is not exposed. I want to make it visible for the external world, so I'm exposing the root. And by the way, I can do the same from the from the web console, and also we have a web-based application for deploying those uh, Spark clusters. But I wanted like to mix it, you know, as, as you can see that I can do something from the command line, and it does things in the in the in the web, web UI. So now the root is exposed, so I can go there, and it doesn't work. <laughs> I can check if everything is up and running by get all. Yeah, it looks good. No, no, no. The container container is still creating, so probably it's it's pulling the container. I can I can I can kill it. It sometimes help. Because uh, Kubernetes or OpenShift tries to assure that there is at least one, in this case, one instance of running pod. And if I kill it, it tries to spin a new one. So probably the previous one, yeah. And so I kill the previous one and the new one is, is now deployed. So if I go to this page, now it works. So this is the Jupyter Notebook. Previously, you may have seen the Zeppelin Notebook. These are different. This is more more famous one. And yeah, so now what you can see here is a Python. I can hide this. I can hide this. Oh, unfortunately, I can't hide the top top bar, so it's relatively, relatively low on the page. So I can check if we are connected to the external cluster, and yeah, we are. I can also create or open the Spark UI uh, 
console and check if there is application attached to this cluster. And uh, sorry, where? No, it should be should be right here on the master. Yeah, this this, this guy is the UI root. It, it's the is the console for for Spark itself. And as we can see, there is one application connected to it, and it runs for 45 seconds. That, so this is our driver application, is the, is the Jupyter Notebook. So now if we evaluate the, these cells, these are sent to the Spark master, and Spark master schedules them to the workers, and once it receive the, the, receives the, the answers, it, uh, it, it, puts, it puts it back to the driver, to the Jupyter Notebook, and we can see them. I also need to change this, this guy. So now what I'm doing, I'm reading these Parquet files, which I have prepared before, using that, uh, using that uh, Parquet converter. You know what, let, let me run all the cells and I will describe them when, I'm, when they're really evaluating, so it will be faster. So what I'm doing here, I'm reading those Parquet files with notes right here and the code is available on github i will give you the link at the end of the presentation so i'm reading all the addresses all the transactions all the uh, blocks i think yeah and mixing them together because it graph this is the graph x uh, technology it expects all the nodes in one big uh, data frame so i'm merging them all together and putting this discriminator column called type this implementation details and this is only a fraction of the blockchain network. This is not whole blockchain because it wouldn't be feasible to do it in a uh, reasonable time. So as you can see, we have four millions of nodes. I think it's transaction for a couple of days. But the framework scales. It, you, can, you can use the same, same approach for the whole blockchain if you have enough time. Yeah, so I've evaluated. Here I'm creating the graph representation in graph frame. Sorry, sorry, I've mentioned this is graph X is actually graph frame. Sorry, it's graph frame. So, so under the covers, it uses, um, it uses data frames, not the RDDs as, as a graph X framework. So here, for instance, I'm cal calculating in degrees and out degrees and creating some basic statistics like standard deviation, average, and yeah, standard deviation and, and average for each type of nodes. So for instance, for, for uh, type T, this is a transaction, we have average degree, in degree is free, red, kind of free, free, free nodes, uh, free, free edges. So in other words, each transaction is as in, as in average free incoming edges. This is the example of the motif language, so it is pretty similar to Cypher, but for instance, I can't create or specify uh, these, these paths, I mean lo reachability, on, on some kind of edges. I can specify only just one, one edge. I can create I don't know, transitive closure or anything like that. It's very simple. I can create those patterns. So for instance, there is, if there is address and there is edge to transaction, and here I will specify what the address actually means. So address means that there is a type that equals to A, and I can specify if the value on the edge is lower than 10,000 10, Fasatoshi, and on the out outcoming edge from the transaction is also lower than 10,000 Satoshi, and it's somehow time windowed because I have the reference for the block, and on the block I have a timestamp, so I can specify the time frame for, for the query when it happened. So these are the results for quite quite complicated query. And I can also visualize piece of the graph because it's really huge, and it wouldn't uh, it wouldn't be nice if I showed everything, but I'm. I will do it anyway in the, at the end. So this is the uh, one transaction visualized. So this is the, the green one is the out input of the transaction, and the the red ones are the outputs. And the nice thing about Jupyter Notebook is that it's interactive. I can I can plug in pretty arbitrary uh, transaction ID right here, and it would work. It would visualize the different transaction for me. So yeah, at the, at the end of the notebook, of this notebook, I'm using NetworkX library. It's a Python library for 
graph visualizing or processing. And I will visualize the same transaction with graph or network X. But it's not as nice. I can show the labels. Yeah, and it's even worse. <laughs> and before, th this library, like this one, it's, it's called Sigma.js. It's JavaScript library for visualizing the graphs. I could have also used D3, but put a more effort to it. But it this is like out of the box working, the Sigma.js. So yeah, and here, in this, in this case, I'm trying to visualize like bigger portion of the graph. It takes uh, four, 0 0.0004. Uh, a random sample of, of this, this fraction and randomly visualize it. Yeah, it's really messy. So this is the graph frames notebook. I've got also a different one, which is called, uh, based on the graph X. So let me deploy this one. Oh, and the, the uh, Docker containers are on Docker Hub. I need to expose the root for this one as well. So this one will use a different notebook technology, actually. It's called Spark, uh, Spark Notebook. And should be, should be accessible under this URL. I will use Firefox for this because they have some issues with Chrome. So yeah, this is similar concept notebook technology, but this time we use Scala. It's different binding, different language. And I will, again, I will evaluate, evaluate everything and describe what it does. This time I'm, I'm using this uh, representation where each address is connected, connected to each other address, but there is no other information like blocks, transactions, or even values on the edges. It's because I'm gonna run the PageRank algorithm, which is uh, prepared in this library and I don't need this information, it's, it's faster. So yeah, I'm, this is, I'm massaging the data I'm cleaning because it contains the, some prefixes so I can remove them. And this is, this is, this is Spark and I'm uh, working in, I'm using R RDDs, this is a different concept than graph frames. It's called Resilient Distributed Datasets. It's like lower level, uh, it's not optimized uh, by this catalyst uh, optimizer as, 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 graph as data frames, but it's, in a way, it's more powerful. And, yeah, so right now the, the evaluation of this cell is running. It's calculating the page rank. Uh, so for each address, it tries to find its rank. I, I guess it's not necessary to introduce page rank, but in a couple of words. It's an iterative algorithm that for, this is the result running of page rank on some very small graph. It tries to to to, uh, to put to put higher rank on those nodes that have more incoming edges. But at the same time, if the if the node has high rank, it contributes more to the to the other uh, nodes who ha into which he, he points. So, in each step, it tries to update its rank, and it's a form of eigenvector centrality measure. It tries to simulate or like random work through the graph and if we st randomly stop the state, what's the probability that I would end up in this node B, for instance? It's quite high, but this, this node has also high probability even though there is just one inc incoming edge and it's because of the fact that there is a loop from this high, highly ranked node. Yeah, it's, it's sorry? This is arbitrary nodes. Like yeah, I page see, but I mean, it's 40%. That's, that's, I don't fully understand, but that seems to me there's a high probability a transaction ends up there. So what kind of nodes would have that property? Yeah, this, this is the ra random graph on which I want to explain page rank. And yeah, it doesn't make sense for, 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 for blockchain. And actually, once this page rank uh, will finish, these, the results, the ranks, are not actually probabilities. These are like random numbers because they are higher than one. But I, I can represent them as a probabilities by summing everything and normalizing it. But all I need is to rank those addresses by this page rank and uh, see if the highly ranked nodes, addresses in the network, are somehow interesting. Interest, yeah. Before I tried it, it took two minutes and a half. Still calculating, so... 
yeah, it's just finished. And as you can see, there are, for instance, this one. This one has higher, higher probability or higher rank than, than one. So I can. So here I'm sorting them by by the rank, by their rank, and uh, in this notebook I can actually query external websites. So uh, I'm query the. I will be querying the blockchain info for fetching additional information about the nodes. Be it is because I have only a sm small portion of the graph, and I, for instance, I have. I want to have like the overall incoming transactions and overall outgoing transactions from the address. Like how many bitcoins does it receive for all the time or, or send. And I wouldn't be able to reconstruct it for only from this for small fraction of the transaction graph. So that's why I'm, I'm a little bit cheating by, by querying external side for this. Uh, so yeah, I will, I will be kind of augmenting this output with HTML. Sorry? Sure, yeah. What is, what is the main benefit of yeah, what, what I have right now is a framework for working with blockchain data. Main benefits could be, uh, for instance, you, you can use this framework for, uh, for identifying similar addresses in a network. Because as you may know or not, the, 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 the Bitcoin or blockchain is, is a pseudonymous network. We can see all the transactions of each address, but we can't be sure who is behind this address. But, but if we can somehow uh, inspect, I, I mean, see the behavior of some certain address, we can cluster them together and say with some kind of probability these are the same or not. This is just ideas, you know. And it's more like a data analysis. Yes, yes. It's not very useful. This is just for demoing OpenShift. And, you know, you can use our technology, or, which is also open source, and you can do it on cloud. It's, it's pretty, pretty convenient. So this, this is a sorted list of these uh, Bitcoin addresses by this bench rank. And there should be also a link to the external side, in this case, blockchain info. And as we can see, we just found a mining pool called, called fish pool. So just by looking into the graph and its I don't know, topology, we are able to identify kind of significant address in, in, a, in a network. And by the way, fish, uh, these, these mining pools are entities in the Bitcoin network that serves for for miners to like obtain more often less less amount of money because it's highly unlikely that it will be you who will confirm the transactions though so they aggregate into mi those mining pools and these mining pools reward those members by uh, doing that work if the mining pool succeeds to find a new 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 block it will reward all these members who are mining in this this period okay yeah Ten minutes. That's, that's, that's fine. So I can see if there are some other dif interesting one. Now this is, for instance, in this case we don't have any information, and we had the information before because the fishing pool itself put this information into the blockchain info. This is not some magic was, this is not any, any, any magical was happening. Uh, as me, I, can, I have also my Bitcoin address, and I can go to the blockchain info, I think slash text, and I can put some metadata on my address if I want. Yeah, this is different one. This is, for instance, this one is a hot wallet, so this is like wallet in browser or in online, and they want to be identified. You know, it makes sense that they put this tag on on their Bitcoin address. And he, here you can see it actually starts with one fox that hash, and. Actually, finding this address is also a dif difficult task because they have to spend a lot of computer power to come up with a, p a pair of private and public key where the fingerprint of the public key starts with one fox. Sorry? This was a subset of 4 million transactions, right? Subset of what? <laughs> four million. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So you have four million. And it, as you may see, this is the like total number of received or total number of sent of these of these addresses. And this is the resulting uh, uh, resulting or the current balance. For 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 instance, this this address received a huge amount of money, but the balance is zero, it, and it makes sense if it sends every everything what it received. 
So yeah, this, this is the, these are the notebooks. They are on the uh, GitHub repository. Let me switch back to the presentation. So key, key takeaways. Blockchain is out there. Its, it's format is open. You can, you can dive into it. You can see what's there. You can use my framework to convert it to the graph and process it further. This is just starter, you know. It, you, may, you may do a lot of more interesting work. There are two different technologies in, in Spark, one called Graph Frames, one called Graph X. I had bad luck with Graph Frames, for instance, running the PageRank algorithm. Not sure why it was. It was working for relatively small graphs, but once I, uh, I've achieved some threshold, it didn't work. Like I had a lot of auto memories, even on, on relatively high uh, memory platforms. I think it's really, really important to, to create reproducible experiments if you are in the data science community because what happened to me, I re read some scientific paper and they have some data set that is publicly or is achievable in, the, in some zip file or somewhere. And it's relatively hard to reproduce their work. If you put it into the containers and you create these notebooks, it's pretty, pretty easy to, for other guys to you know, extend your work. And as always, like good representation may be crucial. So yeah, please please visit our website, redlinux.io. I will also put some stickers right here if you want some. And yeah, this is my presentation. If you want to download it, and grad you. So. Any other questions? questions? Yeah. No, no, it's not streaming. Uh, yeah. So the question was, if it is doing the streaming mode? No, it's just batch, batch processing. I'm gonna. I want to improve it by streaming. Yeah. Yeah. I want to improve that in the, in that way. It's it's relatively difficult because I don't want to. I don't. I can't do it using this. Um, Binary data st stored in the in the system. I would have to uh, run the Bitcoin D daemon and hook to it using JSON RPC and uh, you know trying to, to see the new transaction and visualize them using uh, Spark. Uh, I was called streaming. Yeah, this is something I want to do. Yeah, yeah what? Was that one diagram that you showed a single transaction with such a large number of outputs? Yeah, it was. Yeah. Is there any insight into why one? It is. It is because uh, I can show you the notebook again. We have time. I actually find find it uh, in a way that uh, firstly I, I I calculated the output edges of each transaction and I sorted them by the output edge and I took the relatively high in the list. I can show you right here. It's filled. It's sorted by out degree, and I'm taking the 8,000 8, one, 8, 800 one. transaction to show because it is unusual. Exactly. I if I pick random one, it will be just a couple of outputs and a couple of inputs. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. exactly. Thank you. Good question. Okay, cool. Thanks a lot. Uh, Yuri is also around, I think. Sorry? Are you around today? So yes, yes, I will be here. So, so if you can catch me later. Yeah, sure. Feel free to, to reach out to him. And uh, the next uh, presenter will be Hannes uh, talking about G-Core a new graph query language.